and welcome to the Renaissance English History Podcast. I'm your host, Heather Tesco, and I'm a storyteller who makes history accessible because I believe it's a pathway to understanding who we are, our place in the universe, and to being more deeply in touch with our own humanity. This is episode 65. It's a little shorter than usual since it is the holidays, and we're going to be indulging my girly side by talking about cosmetics and makeup in the 16th century. If anyone is still looking for a Christmas gift for me, I will totally take a Sephora gift card. Just FYI on that. (laughs) Also, if you're someone who really isn't into cosmetics or makeup, I think this episode will still be interesting to you for its historical value. And those of us who do wear makeup might recognize some of the efforts that people went through in order to be beautiful 500 years ago and how little things have changed. Before I get started, though, a few reminders please check out the Agora Podcast Network, of which this podcast is a proud member. The Agora Podcast of the Month for December is the History of Egypt podcast. You can find it on iTunes or any of the other podcasty sorts of places, as well as egyptianhistorypodcast.com. Remember also that you can get the show notes for each episode. This episode particularly has recipes for Tudor beauty products, for example, along with the book recommendations at englandcast.com. I want to start off this episode with a quote that I think many women will understand when I read it. It's from Castiglione's The Book of the Courtier, which was written between 1513 and 1518. And he says, Haven't you noticed how much prettier a woman is if, when she makes up, she does so with so little that those who see her cannot tell whether she is made up or not? But others are so bedaubed that it looks like they are wearing a mask and dare not laugh because they fear it will crack. Such women never change color except when they dress in the morning and must spend the rest of the day like motionless wooden images. How much nicer it is to see a woman, a good looking one, I mean, of course, a good looking one, I mean, who obviously has nothing on her face, neither white nor red, but just her natural color which may be pale or sometimes slightly tinged with a blush caused by embarrassment or the like, (laughs) maybe with her hair tousled and whose gestures are simple and natural without working at being beautiful. So yeah, that's kind of like the old catch 22 that women today still find themselves in. You're supposed to just have that natural, beautiful glow about yourself without wearing any makeup visible enough so that it looks like you're trying too hard because if you're trying too hard, then that doesn't really count, right? I just thought it was kind of an amusing quote when I found it. As with many things that we talk about in this podcast, the world of cosmetics and makeup changed a lot in the 16th century. When we start off with Henry VIII, we don't actually see a lot of heavy face makeup. But by the end of the period, we see women like Elizabeth herself caking their faces in white lead paint. The changes were in part thanks to trade and new products being available, but it was also down to the changing aesthetics and sense of what a beautiful woman looked like. So let's talk about the ideal woman. The ideal woman, first of all, had super pale skin. Poor women worked outside, and so they would have suntans. But if you were wealthy, that showed that you didn't have to work outside, you would have super, super, super pale skin. So to make the white of your skin stand out even more, This ideal woman would have red cheeks and red lips. Men, interestingly, also wanted to have this white skin, and sometimes they would put foundation on as well, the white lead makeup that we see under Elizabeth. So we have some equal opportunity makeup going on here. It's interesting early on that when Anne Boleyn first attracted Henry VIII's attention, people actually thought to comment on her dark complexion and her hair. And it was because of that, that they said she wasn't really a great beauty because she didn't fit with this ideal of, you know, blonde hair and blue eyes and this kind of rosy complexion. So the ideal woman had fair skin and hair. She had blue eyes and rosy cheeks. But let's step back even further, actually. Makeup has been used since people first saw their reflection in standing water, I suppose. But think about Cleopatra with her dark eyes, right? Evidence of cosmetics goes back to 3000 BC at least. The Egyptians would use dark colors on their eyelashes and on their eyebrows, and they used a form of henna to paint their nails and to color their hair. 
They also had a red ochre to use on their lips and their cheeks. So this actually isn't anything new. But in the early Tudor period, people didn't really use that many cosmetics. The focus was on creams to make your skin soft, and they'd also use honey and sesame oil and beeswax. And actually, that really isn't that much different than the ingredients listing on my Burt's Bees hand lotion now. So it's interesting. One thing about cosmetics in the early period was some people actually thought it was a bad sign to use cosmetics because it meant that you were hiding an illness. So people sometimes associated cosmetics with people trying to hide their smallpox scars or, you know, evidence of having been sick. So people focused more on having really good skin and nails and hair and that kind of thing, rather than actually putting on cosmetics. People also focused on how they smelled. So you would make perfumes from flowers like roses. And that was something that people used quite a lot as well. Under the reign of Elizabeth, though, fashion and makeup took on this new importance at court. And Elizabeth herself led the way, trying out a lot of these new potions and lotions. And that was in part because of her own smallpox scars that she had. So let's talk about this white skin, shall we? Like I said, pale skin was the ideal. And women would go to all sorts of extremes to achieve this look. Think about a portrait of Elizabeth I, and she always has that really white skin, right? There were a lot of ways that you could get this look. Some of them are more difficult than others, and none of them are actually really all that good. (laughs) Some women would actually have themselves bled to appear paler. Yes, ladies, you think putting on some tinted foundation, face powder, mascara, and lip gloss is work. Imagine being bled every day to get the desired shade of skin color that you wanted. Things could get worse, though. Some women would, quote, swallow gravel, ashes, coals, dust, tallow candles, and labor and toil themselves to spill their stomach, only to get a pale bleak color, unquote. So, you know, you wanted to be pale, so you'd make yourself really, really sick and eat ashes and gravel and throw up. Also, women who preferred not to throw up or to use some of the cosmetics or bleed themselves, they would um, be told to whiten their skin by washing in their own urine or wine. Urine or wine makes your skin white. Who knew? For acne, women would use a remedy that was made from lemon juice or rose water mixed with honey and eggshells. That doesn't sound too bad. But then you mix in mercury and alum. Not so good. They would also wash their faces with mercury that was used as a face mask and it would make their skin super, super soft. The main way though, that you would get a white face was with a product called Ceruse. You made this by mixing white lead with vinegar. And because you were in fact smearing lead on your face, it was actually very poisonous. Also, you might not wash it off every day. And in fact, you might just keep applying more and more lead on top of it. So you would have a nice, thick, healthy layer of lead on your face. I'm being facetious. Some people actually theorize that Elizabeth herself was killed in part thanks to the lead poisoning from her makeup. But people would still go ahead and use it to try to hide their smallpox scars like Elizabeth did. Something else that is rather bizarre is that women would often paint false veins on their skin in order to make it look more translucent and youthful. So you would literally use a brush and paint veins on your forehead or your cheeks. Women didn't wear a lot of eye makeup, but they would use coal on their eyelashes and they would make a sort of mascara out of that. Coal began to be imported to England from the Middle East during the Crusades, and so it was becoming a lot more popular and an everyday item for the wealthy women to be able to have. It was also important to have your eyes be the focus, so women would go a little bit extreme with plucking their eyebrows. They had really, really super high arches, and um, yeah, they would do that in order to kind of help frame their eyes the way we do today. So it actually wasn't that much different, but they would just kind of go a little bit extreme with it. You also wanted to have really red cheeks. It's almost what we would consider clown-like now, bright red circles on the cheeks. Women would use the dye from a bug, a cochineal, and this dye is in the bug's body. And cochineal, cochineal, depending on how you say it, 
was actually becoming the dye from this was becoming a, a lot more prevalent in this time period. Thanks in part was one of the things that came from the new world. There was a bigger supply of of the bug. And it's actually there's um, if you listen to this podcast before, when I talked to Susie Digby about music about a year and a half ago, she talked about one of the um, madrigals from this time talking about the, it was called the Andalusian Trader, and you can look for it on Spotify or anywhere. Uh, I was talking about the this trader from Andalusia, talking about all of this cochineal that was coming in thanks to the exploration of, of new lands. So the red dye from Cochineal was becoming a lot more popular. You would use it on your face and on your lips. You could also use a dye from Matter or Vermilion as well. So your face would be really, really white, possibly with fake veins, likely washed in your own urine or wine with all kinds of things like egg whites and lead caked on. Pretty attractive, it's so funny how these things change, right? How your your views of what it, what's attractive changes. I think about that. It's like, Ugh. but in 500 years, maybe somebody will look at my bare minerals and go, Ugh. who knows, right? So then you'd have these clown circles painted on your cheeks. You'd have coal mascara and you'd have overly plucked eyebrows and bright red lips, which kind of makes me think of something that you would have seen in Camden Town in the 80s. <laughs> the popular hair colors were anything fair. So you wanted to be fair. You wanted to be blonde or light red like Elizabeth herself. So you would dye your hair sometimes. You could use urine again, really useful stuff with also a mix of oil or cumin, saffron, a lot of different red sorts of uh, plants and seeds that you could use and mix that up with a little bit of urine and get yourself a nice hair dye out of that. All of these ingredients were expensive, except not the urine, probably. So no one apart from the very wealthy could afford them. So if you were able to afford to dye your hair red, it was, again, another sign, a status symbol. You could also, that was for the blonde, actually. And then for the red, you could also use henna as your hair dye. Some women also wore wigs. That was an alternate to dyeing your hair. Queen Elizabeth herself has has been said to have around 80 wigs when she died. The most popular style of hair was to actually have a really high hairline. So a lot of women would actually pluck the hairs on the top of their heads and on the top of their forehead so that their hairline would go back about an inch or so, kind of closer to the crown of your head. And Elizabeth all, herself also did this. And she also had a condition alopecia, which made her lose her hair. So that's why she likely wore a wig. But if you imagine the portraits, the women's all the women always had these really high foreheads. And then they would have the wigs on top of that. And like I said, Elizabeth had 80 wigs. So she was a big fan as well. So this has been fun. There are a couple of book recommendations this week, and I have them all up on the website with links to purchase. One of them is Face Paint, The Story of Makeup by Lisa Eldridge. Remember, you can get the show notes. In this week's show notes, there's also a YouTube video of a a girl I found who does makeup. She's a makeup artist, and she does kind of tutorials on how to do makeup from certain time periods. So she did one on Anne Boleyn. So I put that up there. And you can also sign up for the newsletter, all that kind of stuff at englandcast.com. You can also tweet me at Tesco, T-E-Y-S as in Sam, K-O. You can also go to facebook.com slash englandcast. So thank you so much for listening. The next episode is going to be a joint one I did with the gentlemen of the Reconsider podcast. They were here visiting me in Andalusia a couple of weeks ago, and we did a couple of joint episodes. The one I'm releasing on my feed is where we talk about how the principles of their political podcast can actually be applied to studying Tudor England. Then later in January, I'm going to get into war with France mode because, you know, when in doubt, have war with France. Not literally. I don't mean that literally, but that kind of seemed to be Henry VIII's thinking. (laughs) We're going to do a few episodes on French foreign policy during the 16th century, how it changed. And then we're also going to have that kind of culminate in an episode devoted to the field of cloth of gold, which will be in February. So I think that's it. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you're having a wonderful holiday. And-
and I will speak with you again soon. Bye bye. Blow northern wind, send for baby sweating. Blow northern wind, blow, blow, blow. Ich hoor te boord in bouwrubriek, dat soli samlies ontzicht.